All right, man, here we are. Episode 22 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema. We're back, man. We are back with a vengeance, as they say. I don't know who says it, but, you know, some people probably have said it. Uh, anyways, man. So, uh, thanks for all who listened to last week's. Last week's was, uh, was, uh, recorded right after, uh, something pretty, pretty awful happened. And, uh, that's why that episode is a bit shorter and I'm not quite as lively in that one, man. But, uh, you know, you just gotta move on. You just gotta, you can't let things drag you down, man. You just gotta keep on going no matter how much it might hurt. You just, you just really gotta keep on keeping on, man. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're not going to sit around and mope. We're not going to wonder about what could have been, what was. All we're going to do is going to make be, man. That's not a better in my head. So let's just get on with it, man. Uh, let's see. I finished up a book recently. I want to talk about it. I briefly mentioned before one of my, uh, probably my favorite podcast right now is the Rialto Report from Ashley West and his wife, whose name uh, I am blanking on right now. I probably should have been prepared, but I'm not. It is It is April Hall. That is right. I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, these two people should be definitely credited with the intensive amount of hard work they put into their website, their blogs, and their show. Um, it's just an amazing show, man. It's just all about the golden age of adult films interviews with actors talking about films you get real insights man and it's just even if that's not really your thing even if you're somebody who's not really a fan of a lot of adult films and stuff um i think these interviews have definitely been very eye-opening with some of these people and and oftentimes have been very um emotional they one of my favorite episodes I should, I should say, actually, two of my favorite episodes have been ones about Jamie Gillis, who's a very famous adult film star. If you're not familiar, he's been in a bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, Arbola, a.k.a. Robert Kerman, who, um, you know, horror fans definitely probably, you know, definitely know from Cannibal Holocaust and a uh, brief part, a small part in Cannibal Ferox, but he's primarily an adult film actor. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Um, anyways, man, but... Uh, it, they, I think, helped produce or helped write this book. It was one of the two. It says that, I'm on the website now, it says April is a co-author of the book. And I think probably, yeah, that's it. Ashley co-wrote it as well. So, which is probably why the book itself, which the book I'll be talking about briefly for a little bit, is American Ecstasy, My 30-Year Search for a Happy Ending by John Amaro, who... Uh, man, what an interesting guy, man. This is truly, this is just one of my favorite uh, autobiographies that I've read. And it's one of my favorite kinds of books to read, man. Because I read a lot, but I primarily, almost exclusively only read nonfiction. I just don't, I just find uh, it to be more interesting than um, than just a lot of fic- fiction novels. I just, but, uh, you know, to each their own. But this book was absolutely fantastic, and I finished it probably about a couple weeks ago, so it's still uh, relatively fresh in my head, but this is one that definitely should be on your radar if you are at all interested in autobiographies. It um, kind of goes through this uh, through this period of time. Uh, John Amaro, who um, was a gay uh, porn director, um, and it's interesting to st- where he, you know, especially for gay adult cinema as well. I find the golden age such a interest, probably the most interesting, you know, the most interesting period of of adult cinema in that regard. You had a lot of cool um, gay films and gay filmmakers coming out um, recently. I, you know, I, I, a while ago I was going to talk about that Fred Halstead collection that Vinegar Syndrome put out, who was a a gay filmmaker from California. I believe i might be wrong about that but he's got he was a really cool interesting um experimental adult filmmaker um the films in that set are uh what la plays itself um sex tool and there was another one that i don't think i've seen but really interesting guy and um just these one of these one of these kinds of adult filmmakers who um was, was really trying to do something cool and i think the reason why a lot of people including myself find this era of uh cinema so interesting when it comes to adult cinema is that it was a lot of filmmakers who were really trying to, who were making really cool movies, man. And, and they, yeah, they had, you know, hardcore unsimulated sex in it and were definitely, you know, sometimes 
you know, more times than not, I would say we're going for eroticism. But there's a lot of times I mixed Roger Watkins before, who I find such an interesting guy, and I I really think he could have been like a big filmmaker because most famously he did House on Dead End Street, um, also known as the Cuckoo Clocks from Hell, um, and then he went on to do a bunch of um, a handful of um, adult films, uh, a couple of which were put up by Vinegar Syndrome, which is how I got familiar with them. But I mentioned before her name was Lisa. I think that's such a cool, mean spirited adult film that. Um, uh, with a really just vicious gang rape scene that is just like uh, it's just really nothing erotic about it, man. It's very ugly, but that's the that's the thing is that when you mention that a film has hardcore sex in it, it's 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 not always meant to titillate. I think what Gerard Demiano especially was doing was so interesting because you know he did Deep Throw and that's you know I've talked about that before on the show. Actually, I devoted, devoted the whole episode to Deep Throw. Go ahead and look at my channel and find that episode. Um, but like what he would would go on to do, man, he did a real cool stuff. The Devil Miss Jones and uh, I think he did um, the Taming of Rebecca. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure he did. Um, and then he did Memories within Miss Aggie. Man, he's just. A really cool guy, and you have a lot of these guys like John Amaro and his brother, um, who they had their own company, the Amaro Brothers, who were putting out a lot of making a lot of cool films, man. And you know they're working with like Roberta and Roberta Finley and um, uh, her husband whose name I am blanking on at the moment. I apologize, guys. I'm by no means, like, an expert on any of this. I'm just a fan, so I, if I forget some names, I, I do apologize. I'm just a fan. So um, if you if you want to go to an expert, if you want to learn more about this, then you got to check out the Realtor Report. They're, they're, they're the authorities on this, man. The, those two are just totally just incredible. But um, with this book, it does track the... Um, what, what John Amaro was doing, how he was trying to get um, a lot of films made, and um, the the shifting of the tide from softcore to hardcore features, where um, it became kind of tricky for him when they started to be more about less titillation from, you know, simulated sex to now full-on hardcore sex, including gay hardcore sex, um, which is uh, very interesting how a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, some filmmakers like this who weren't as ready to probably jump on the transition to, to do that, you know? And I think there is an argument to be said about softcore versus hardcore films. I personally find, uh, you know, softcore films probably a little more interesting because I think, I forgot who said it. I think it may have been Frank Hannenlotter who said it, but something along the lines of where with softcore, there's still that illusion of mystery, of titillation, whereas with hardcore, it's all out there, man. There's no mystery there. And I, I, I'm horribly, horribly misquoting him, but he said, he said something along along those lines, and um, I, I never saw the documentary he did, that exploitation, because truthfully, I don't find the the, the whole, because before Softcore, there was the whole nudie cutie stuff, and I don't really find a lot of those films interesting, man, I, I've watched a bunch of them, and a lot of them I'm just not, I, I just end up finding kind of boring, man, and I, I understand they're more for the imagery of just, hey man, we got this naked girls, you know, but like, when I look at like early Russ Meyer stuff, man, some of those are real chores to sit through, and uh, and I mentioned before briefly on the Godfather episode, the uh, Francis Coppola's, I think it was his first film, it was the Bell Boy and His Playgirls, I think it was called, and I just thought, thought that was a real chore to sit through, man. So the softcore stuff, I just find more interesting, as I as I keep saying, but there's you know there's but but I love the hardcore films as well. I'm, I'm not saying I don't. I just there's just something different to them. But um, I. I like I was mentioning before, that transition from softcore to hardcore, they talk about Amaro's, um, who, you know, was gay, but he kind of uh, was a little iffy on making, like, gay films and stuff, and, and it's just, he's just such an interesting guy, I mean, he's, he's led such an interesting life, and the people in his life, his lovers and his um, brother as well, and sort of their, uh, both of them being gay, but having that kind of difficulty with one another, um, being, being open to each other. And man, I gotta say that when it gets to the third act in this book and, you know, real people start, uh, dying off for a number, of, you know, a couple of different reasons, uh, it, it really just like, almost, I mean, it almost made me teary eyed, man. There's one part where he talks about his brother who has passed away and, and his just seeing him like that, man, uh, it just really, Man, it really was like a total gut punch, man. I was just like, and, and but it was so so expertly done because it doesn't dwell on it for too long. It gives the proper amount of time, going that this is the time. These are the times that are changing, and um, unfortunately, these are you know people are gonna come and go, man. And um, they also talk about the uh, which is kind of the, the the nail in a lot of this was the, you know when when age was coming in, and a lot of people at first you know really weren't 
taking it too seriously, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, productions were getting shut down because of that. A lot of filmmakers were, were just, they were just stop, they were stopping um, making films because when it actually started to happen, and especially a lot of gay filmmakers, when it was starting to happen to a lot of them, which I think I read, I believe it was Fred Halstead's boyfriend who died of AIDS, and then that's, uh, I think the reason why he killed himself, uh, to my knowledge, man, I should really do a Fred Halstead episode. I don't know why I haven't, man. Um, but with all that said, and they talk about the big film that they did, Blonde Ambition, which got um, different versions. It got like an R-rated. I, I think it, I might be misremembering this, but I thought I got a softcore and a hardcore version. I, I believe it had three different versions of it. But either way, I would say with this book, even if you're somebody who's not particularly... Um, if you're not a fan of the golden age of adult cinema, I think this is just a really interesting story about a kid, about a guy who was at a, it was, you know, was at a certain place, a certain time being gay and making these films for an audience and sort of the cultural shift that was happening because of it, not because of him, but because of the, just the, you know, from, from the sixties to when he eventually just stopped making them, um, John Amaro is just a very interesting guy. He's had a very interesting life, and I feel like this is a guy who they make he'd be able to make a great film out of it. Um, some of these, some of these autobiographies from from adult films, uh, adult film stars and filmmakers, I just find so fascinating. Um, yeah, it's it's just great, man. I I really want to read the uh, uh, the Linda Lovelace one. Not that she wrote the one that the uh, her friend wrote that. Um, I'm blanking on the name of it because um, she wrote her own. I think she wrote two actually, but both of those are her account that has been um, disputed and, and and it's a lot of he said she said. It's sort of um, she says one thing about them making a deep throat and a lot of a lot of other people say the other thing. But that's uh, you know neither here nor there. But but um, her friend or somebody was was uh, who I actually mentioned the book on the show before. But uh, of course I'm not prepared. You know these are just for fun. But uh, I definitely want to read that as well. But um, I paid about twenty bucks for it, and it's not a long book either, man. You can get you can, I got through it fairly quickly, um, and it's just really interesting. And, and the the name American Ecstasy comes from one of the those uh, the satellite channels that you would get um, that Amer that John was involved in. Which I mean that's a whole rabbit hole right there. I, I find the history of of public access and um, you know pirate channels and. And uh, all that kind of stuff, I find that so fascinating, man. Hell, I you know I, I could I could probably write a book on all that. That's you know that's me patting myself on the back. But uh, anyways, man, American Ecstasy. Um, yeah, it's on Amazon. I'm I think that's probably the main place to buy it, um, unless there's somewhere else. I mean, there's probably, probably there are, like book sites you can buy it from. Uh, like you, I think probably Barnes and Noble would have it. I would assume. But yeah, just just check it out, man. It's just a really one of the best books I've read of uh, recent memory. I. Uh, I, I, I log my progress on Goodreads. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that site. It's basically just like you just have friends on there and you, uh, you know, track what you're reading, you know, see recommendations and stuff. And I was looking at what I've read this year and I was like, man, this is definitely one of the top books I've read this year. It's, it's just, this is pretty, pretty up there, man. This is just a really incredible book. So check it out, man. Check out the Rialto Report. They're doing the Lord's work. They're just... They're just amazing at what they do, man. And it's just you, you go on the website, man. That's a rabbit hole because you'll just you'll just find yourself just going deep in all these great picture galleries, all the uh, all the uh, episodes. They've been doing this since 2013, I think, and it's just it's just really incredible, man. All right. Actually, speaking of what I mentioned before with Russ Meyer. Uh, I think I've mentioned on the show before, I really don't know, that I've been going through Russ Meyer's filmography from the start. I'm only going for feature films, no documentaries, no shorts, no none of that. And I have only two films left. i got to watch Up and Beneath the Valley of the Super Vixens. Um, or Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixen, Vixens, I'm sorry, I think was the title. Um, I'm pretty sure those are the last two uh, I'm not, yeah, whatever. I was going to open up the thing, but I'm not going to. But uh, with that said, I watched from 1975 Super Vixens. And man, oh man, what a wild movie. Um, the thing, Russ Meyer is such an interesting filmmaker because you can really look at two halves of his career. Uh, a lot of the early nudie films he was making, I don't find very interesting at all. In fact, I, I really have some negative things to say about him. But... It's a time and a place, man, and, you know, it's, I get it. it. They're just not for me, and I don't think they are 
as much fun to watch now, but every now and then he would, he would like make a film that'd be cool and interesting. And then in the second half of, you know, he'd make like early on, he did like mud honey, which, um, which was a, you know, which is an all right film. I'm not crazy about, I'm not crazy about it, but in the second half of his career, when he started making these films, like, uh, like Cherry, Harry, and Raquel, and, uh, especially, you know, if you've seen Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, that, that crazy-ass movie, um, <laughs> you know, um, but Super Vixens, Super Vixens is, is freaking bizarre, man, it's like, I don't even know what to say about it. it, it's not my favorite Russ Meyer film, I think that honor still goes to the classic Faster Pussycat, um, but man, it's definitely right up there. It's it's wild, man. The tone of this film is completely all over the place. There's these, there's like, it, it's played very comedically at times, and then you have these horrific sequences, man, of just violence and express and but this like wacky banjo music and stuff. It's totally wild, man. There's um, I think this was the film that uh, Quentin Tarantino had mentioned on the Pure Cinema podcast one time. Um, which I think I've mentioned that show before, but if I haven't, you know, Pierce Simo Podcast is one of the best podcasts going, man. Yeah, I love those guys, Brian and Elric. But um, I, I, I think this was a film he had mentioned that had that had like a, a really vicious sequence early on. And I, I, it, this or the next film he, uh, you know, Russ Meyer did up. But um, yeah, there's a sequence early on in this film. It's, it's so well done. It's like uh, this really, but it's like bizarre at the same time too. You have these two characters and this guy. There's the there's the squeaky chair man. There's a freaking squeaky chair. Jeez Louise man, freaking thing. Um, but this guy is like going after this chick in a house, and I think it's his wife or his girlfriend. And it's totally insane and completely it's intense, man. I mean. I mean, it's, it's, but they're playing this wacky music behind it and, uh, you know, behind this horrible, horribly violent sequence. And, um, and then it just keeps going on, man. And, and she barricades herself in the bathroom and he's just mercilessly pounding at the door. And, and I don't know who that actor is, man, but he was, they're both of them are fantastic in the role. And, um, and he's just viciously just stabbing at the door, man. And and she goes from being afraid of him to start like laughing at him, which I don't know if that was really the best idea given this crazy ass guy. Um, and just <laughs> something something happens with a knife in the door that made me laugh out loud, man. I watch these films by myself, and that when there's something that happens involving a knife in a door, and oh my gosh, man, it was just. But then the rest of the film is pretty lighthearted. It's just like, uh, there's moments of violence throughout, but it's just totally wild. And I can't even tell you really what's going on some of the time. I mean, we got this guy who's going around, he's meeting these girls who, uh, he gets himself into various, uh, circumstances where these girls get on him. There's like a whole scene in a barn where this, this guy brings him in because he was injured or he was hitchhiking or something like that. I don't remember. But, um this like German or this Austrian girl is like, uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, <laughs> looking at it now, he pretty much just rapes him, but it's played for comedy. You know, it's a guy raping a girl. It's pretty, you know, I don't know. I don't think that would really fly now, but Hey man, you know, it's for the sake of the film. It's, it's all, it's all laughs and everybody's yucking it up and it's just it's totally wild sequence. And he's telling her, no, no, get off me, get off me. And she's just not having it, man. Which, Hey man, <laughs> if the rules are reversed, it'd be a little different. I would imagine in terms of, uh, you know, but, um, yeah, you have sequences like that and you have the, you know, in, in Russ Meyer fashion, plenty of big breasted women walking around. Uh, uh, who was the, God, what's the name of that chick? Uh, Ah, jeez, Louise, man. There was one chick um, in the film who like ended up like disowning the film and stuff. Uh, yeah, Colleen Brennan. She has these real big uh, breasts, and uh, and uh, I mean, looking at the IMDb trivia, you got to take it with a grain of salt because anyone can really write some of the stuff. But uh, yeah, she apparently she was not a fan of Russ Meyer and and saying that he was pretty uh, misogynistic and his films were, which uh, you know I could see where she's coming from, but I don't think I I agree with. But then again, I never met the man. She's the one who worked with him, so I'm not gonna dispute any of her. Um, you know, it's, it's her right to say whatever she wants. But um, 
it, there's uh, it's strange because for a while this was like okay this is actually becoming one of my favorite uh, Russ Meyer films you know some of the sequences are just really crazy and and that whole sequence um, in the house I mean if this was played as a drama it's like man Russ Meyer was was like really talented in that regard um, but then some of the more um, sexual sequences I just I don't find as interesting. Um, just, you know, these women coming around with these, with this guy, uh, I think the, I'm looking on IMDb now, I think the lead is Charles Pitt, um, I, I think so, I really don't know, um, but, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm on, the, I'm on the IMDb page now, and I see the, go one of the goofs is that the cheeseburger eaten by the main character at the Super Vixens Oasis has everything on it except a burger. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> I should also say the lead is Clint Ramsey. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, man. Yeah, Clint Ramsey played by Charles Pitt. It's, it's freaking wild, man. I tell you. The problem with a lot of these Russ Meyer films is that... Like, there'll be cool moments, but then there'll be, like, really just uninteresting sequences throughout. Like, I was talking about before, Cherry, Harry, and Raquel, and um, Finders, Keepers, Lovers, Weepers. Both of those films have really cool moments in them where you go, man, this is cool. But then there's a lot of just messing around. There's a lot of nonsense going on. And I understand to appeal to an audience who is going to these cinemas because, you know, there's no internet back then. So you want to go see some naked girls doing some crazy stuff. You got to go out of your house, man. You got to go to the cinema. You know, I would have loved to been there and just, you know, go see these films in the cinema. But, um, I, and I get that. I, I can't, I definitely can't complain or judge it from a 2022 standard. However, watching it now, I did find myself spacing out and, and stirring some sequences through his films, that, you know, that where they just go on about just these these sexual sequences. Um, I just find myself looking at my phone or doing or just spacing out, man, because they're really, really a bore to sit through, man. A chore, a chore, not a bore, I'm not talking about. Um, but Super Vixens, ah, Super Vixens, it, it's just, it's just a wild film. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned before uh, with Russ Meyer is that his films are, are not really available. Um, you have, you know, you got to go online to watch these besides, um, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and the other one he did for Fox, the Seven Ups or whatever that movie was called. I don't even know how readily available that is, honestly, but Beyond the Valley of the Dolls has a criterion, so it's readily available because it's a Fox film. Uh, but his other films, I think he owns outright, which is why there's never been any real release of them. Um, you can find, uh, if, if you're, if you want like a collection of them, uh, Sloppy Seconds, who is, uh, does a lot of bootlegging of titles, um, which is, uh, which is great. You know, um, um, I think it's a one man operation to my knowledge, but there's a lot of stuff I've bought from him that it's just not possible to get anywhere else where just the films that were never released, um, on, on any sort of media or like, uh, on cut versions. Like I bought like the legend of the Overfiend collection, which are mostly uncut to my knowledge. I think there is some missing footage, um, that wasn't able to be sourced or something, but you know, stuff like that or like the devils, like uncut and stuff. Um, he has a collection of the Russ Meyer stuff and I don't, I, I don't know it includes, I think, I really don't know, actually. You know what? I have the time right now. Let's go to the website now, and we're going to take a look. Because if you're interested in checking out some of these films and you don't want to watch it online, uh, you know, you're, you're going to want to go to this guy. So it's an 18-film set on two region-free Blu-rays. Next, another important thing is region-free. Um, now, it doesn't list all the films. I'm on the website now. Did Africa Audio not get a DVD? I could have sworn Africa Audio did. In Africa, Blood and Guts, uh, the two versions of that film, because I see he has it on Blu-ray here. Maybe it's just that he has it on Blu-ray is the thing, because um, that definitely has a Blue Underground DVD. Um, okay, it says 18 film set, but I it doesn't list the film, so take that as you will. Um, he also has some other cool stuff on here um, that you can browse through, along with some uh, true crime stuff. He has, like, the Richard Lopez tapes, if you're familiar with that case at all, uh, you know, I'm looking into that, but um, I bought the Ilsa collection from him, and I, I watched those films because those films I, are, I think, were on DVD. I don't think, they, but they never got a Blu-ray, and and uh, you know, I mean, it, it, you can't it, the the quality is what it is. These are bootlegs. These are you know, just one guy. But you know, I mean, you're getting the films, so it's something. Getting them at least having a copy of them, you know. Um, 
So just heads up on that. But yeah, man, it's just it's just a uh, oh god, what was the film that my buddy lent me? Oh geez, Louise, that came from Sloppy Seconds. It was um oh gosh, I'm let me find that film. There's a film that my my buddy bought from him. It was like an, it was an Asian film. And it was freaking wild, man. It was totally insane. It was um. I just uh, let me find it here. Trilogy of Lust. Gosh, man, from '95. What a crazy ass film. That's one of the craziest endings I've ever seen to a film. Uh, <laughs> it's freaking wild, man. So yeah, check him out, man. Uh, Super Vixens is online. You can definitely find it. I asked how I had to watch it. it was just online, but uh, yeah, you can definitely find it. A lot of these films aren't on you. You know, like uh, what I'll do sometimes is that if a film is on YouTube, I'll watch it on my Roku on my TV, which you get mixed results. I watch that film. Uh, that early Kevin Bacon film on Forty uh, Second Street. Um, what the hell is it called? It was uh, my memory's awful this morning. It's six, six, ten in the morning, man. My memory is absolutely terrible in the morning. But I watched uh, that film. Um, uh, let me find it right now because it got mentioned by um, by half, I think Forty Second Street Peter it was in Killing for Culture. As someone had it, it was. Um, yeah, 40 Deuce from 1982. This was actually a year after he did Diner. Oh, that's what it was, man. It was directed by Paul Morrissey, um, the, uh, you know, from Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula. Yeah, I watched this on YouTube, man, and the qual- oh my gosh, this is one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the worst looking films I've ever seen in my life in terms of transfer. It was, it looked like it was transferred from a VHS that had been recorded off a of VHS that was subtitled in a different language that had, like, ads on it from, like, some TV station area in, like, France. Uh, because the subtitles were in French, I think. Oh my gosh, man! It, you can find it on YouTube. Just, just like watch for five seconds, and then walk. Imagine watching it on a goddamn modern day 4K TV, man. It's, it's not ideal, but hey, man. You know, like we can't all have nice crisp 4K UHD Blu-rays, man. We can't have all these great bonus features with director's commentary, behind the scenes featurettes, and all that, man. You kind of just got to do what you got to do. Um, but uh, wow, I went off on a tangent there for that again. But that's all will be for today, guys. So uh, to wrap it up, American Ecstasy, you can get it on Amazon. Super Vixens, you can find online or go to Sloppy Second Sales to check out that Russ Meyer 18 film collection. I forgot to look at the price on that, but uh, it's on there, man. Anyways, after all said and done, no matter how bad things might get, you got to push forward, man. You got to do the work because you can't lay around moping all day wondering about, you know, this should have happened or that should have happened or I wish that this didn't happen. You know, you can't live with the regrets, man. You can't live in the past. There's nothing you can do about it. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. All you can do is just be a better person, man. Be the person you want to be. Move forward and follow your dreams, man. However, however corny that sounds, man, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to go, I wish I did this and I wish I did that. But now's the time to do it, man. Just freaking do it. Who are you waiting for? You know? Um, that's all I got, man. All right. Thank you for listening and we'll be back next week.